church. We're going to be looking at uh, Revelation 10 and 11 uh, today. If you're coming and you're, you haven't been with us the last 10 weeks, you're going to be like coming into a movie where you haven't got a clue what's going on. So you're going to have to enjoy I actually, I, I remember taking uh, my son Luke to a one-man Lord of the Rings show. Okay, so the guy was on there and he, he was just in a black costume and Lord of the Rings. And he's got everybody there. And uh, so he's going to play out the whole of the Lord of the Rings just himself. What? Okay. No. And so at the beginning of it, he goes, who here has seen the movie? Lots of people like that. Who has read the book? Okay. He, who's in there? He goes, has anybody not read the book, not seen the movie, and doesn't know what Lord of the Rings is? Three people put their hands up and went, you haven't got a clue what's going on today. <laughs> and then it it's like, your fault, you get no okay. But um, <laughs> the title of the next message is, an end but not the end. Come on. Whoa, come on. So when is the end not really the end? Well, let me ask you, have you ever been in a moment where you thought it was the end of your life? <laughs> that car crash nearly happening. Yeah. I was in a, I've had a lot of those moments. I remember, I, I, I was going to share a different one, but then Jordan re reminded me I had my walk. And, <laughs> uh, so soccer is a big game in England, and there's always a home derby. Now, I, I support a team called Norwich, and they support uh, their home derby is Ipswich. Well, the only way I could get to the home derby was with my friends who all supported Ipswich. Oh, so I got in what they used to call the cage, but with the opposite facts. Oh, now, this was a time of extreme violence where they would burn uh, the, the um, scarves of the other team and they would melt and then throw 50 pence coins, like 50 cents coins of each other through the cages. Oh. So anyway, so here I am, a Norwich fan, but I'm in the Ipswich cage. Uh -oh. So every time Norwich score, I'm like, okay, so it gets 1-0 up, 1-0, 2-1 up, 2 all. It's the 89th minute, and the game finishes at 90 minutes. And I'm behind Ipswich goal. So uh, Martin O'Neill, I can still remember that 89th minute, one minute to go, has a free kick. It's 2 all. He kicks it. He scores. Now remember, I'm in a cage with Ipswich fans, and I go, yeah! <laughs> At that moment, I thought it was the end. <laughs> now, I can't remember how I got out, if an angel rescued me or whatever. But we've all had those moments where we have gone, dear Lord, if you get me out of this moment, I promise I'll devote my life to you. <laughs> this is the moment where he's calling that card. Okay. So, as we get through Revelation, basically, once you actually read Revelation in its entirety, you see it's like one of those movies where you go off here and then there's a tangent. You know, it sort of goes three years earlier or two weeks earlier or something like that. So just as an interlude came between the sixth and the seven seals, another one comes between the sixth and the seven trumpets. And if any of you fall asleep, I'm all asleep. Hey! Right, so be careful. Okay. Um, but both interludes answer a question. The first one is, the question is, you know, how the people of God will be affected by the judgments coming? Like, is it just the unrighteous will get, um, you know, uh, dealt with? The second one, which is John's question, even if he didn't answer it, is what's the, how long is Revelation going to go for? Like, we've had all this dramatic rebuking and, and plagues and everything, like, the end's coming, right? <laughs> and so he's asking, how long is this going to go on for? Why? Because the last trumpet, even today we go, the last trumpet, when you go, the last trumpet, you would think that that symbolizes the end of the world. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the last trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and will be changed. So this is this view of, if it's the last trumpet, then it's going to be the end of the world. However... We're only halfway through the book of Revelation. Now remember, when John is first receiving that, he doesn't know he's halfway through. So it's really teaching us here that this is not the final judgment in some way. We're just halfway through, and we've got a lot more to come. So there's a longer message to come, even after the final trumpet was blown. In fact, you've got half the book to go. All right. So point one, sweet and sour. Do you ever like sweet and sour Chinese food? Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> sweet and sour balls, pork balls. That's what's okay. All right. Anyway, it's got nothing to do with the Revelation. I'm just going to talk about Point one, sweet and sour, Revelation 10, 1 to 11. So remember, John is there viewing this for the first time. Try and get yourself in the mood while I blow the trumpet. Okay. 
Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. So basically, John sees an incredible uh, vision of uh, an angel, similar to that of Jesus in Revelation 1. And he's holding a little scroll, and just in case you didn't know what a scroll is, this is a scroll. Oh. Now, this is actually the scroll I asked my wife to be my wife. Oh. This is a piece of cardboard from, like, um, uh, Office Works. I painted it with tea and then burnt it all around there. And when I asked her, I got a St. Paul's Cathedral where a pri- uh, Prince Diana and Charles were married before it went pear shape. Oh. And, uh, I got around the false pretenses, and this was wrapped up in my umbrella. And I got permission to ask her on the same steps where Charles and Diana got married. And I got down with my scroll and I said, <laughs> Never did I ponder so deep or dream so high as to how perfect a woman could be for me. For you I would give my all, for you I would gladly die. My closest friend, my deepest joy. I cannot bear for us to be apart. The very thought pains me inside. So I've decided, if you'll have me, to ask, please, my darling Kerry, will you be my wife? Wow. So what's the point? Okay. A scroll means something important. All right? okay. I don't make one of these for a shopping list. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the point is, a scroll is meant to be like, we're going to hear something. Okay, now I've lost my point. Okay, all right, I just... All right, okay. Kerry's like, whatever. Okay. <laughs> right. So he's holding a little scroll, but later he's going to be told to eat the scroll. No, we're not going to eat the scroll, okay. <laughs> right. Planting one foot on the sea and one on the earth may show this universal message like it's going to go everywhere. He's shouting like a roaring lion. It suggests that it's not a happy, like if you see a lion come to you, you're like, Ooh. okay. All right. The seven thunders indicate a premonition of divine judgment. So there's going to be some judgment that comes. But before John can write the judgments down, a voice tells him to seal up the message. A couple of verses later, we find out why. The warning trumpets had not promoted repentance in the hearers, and now judgment will be delayed no longer. So up until now, we've read Revelation. It's going, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. And people are like, when's it going to happen? Come on, you're going to rest. Have you ever prayed for those prayers? But Lord, we've been praying about this for like 10 years. Are you going to, like, have you gone deaf or what? Okay, like, come. He's like, that's enough. These guys have not repented. You ever feel like you can leave sin undealt with in your life? You ever felt like that? You go, I know this keeps coming up, God, but I tell you what, on my goals this year, I'm going to decide to deal with this in my life. The Lord says, oh, really? (laughs) Do you think I'm going to leave that other thing, that characteristic in your life, undealt with? Lack of finances or bitterness, whatever. You go, oh, really? He said, you know what? Your list is not my list. And isn't that just how people go? They just go, you know, God, I want you to do this. That's really interesting you come and pray to me about that, because that's not on my list for you. (laughs) You see, is your list the same as God's list? Do you look to use God or to be used by God? Now, this concept then of sealing up brings to mind the principle stated in a couple of verses, Deuteronomy 29, 29, we'll talk about. It talks about the secret things belong to our Lord God. But the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may follow all the words of the law. So you ever felt like I wish there were other things in the Bible? Like people ask me questions or I have questions and I want to find that scripture. Believe me, if God answered every question in the world, the Bible would be so big you would be put off from it. Even today people go, look at the size of that, I'm not reading that. 
The Bible gives us in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, we can be thoroughly equipped for every good word. It's given us enough. Mm. At times, we want more stuff to be in the Bible. I think about, we were out evangelizing Chris. You know, I was feeling timid this week, so I was like, who do I phone up to help me evangelize Chris? He's always bold. So I'm like, mate, take me out there. So we went out there, it was really great fun. And we uh, spoke to this guy, and he was one of those guys that stops, you know, like this is on the way to a gym, like, come on, let's have a conversation. I know we spoke for half an hour or something like this. Man, he had so many opinions. He was like, do you believe in dinosaurs? Do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? Do you believe in that? And I said, this is just crazy. He goes, the Bible says it. And you how did I said, have you ever read the Bible? He said, no. <laughs> I said, you've got all these opinions. Here's a quote by Liam Nielsen uh, this week. It says, the problem with closed-minded people is that their mouths are always open. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, he was talking about, and it always gets back to this, what about Genesis and creation and everything like that? Well, the Bible, what people don't realize is the Bible is not a science book. It's a book about relationships. So imagine this. There's a famous book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. Imagine I went up to the author, Dale Carnegie. Where does it say about the dinosaurs in this book? <laughs> All right? If you want to influence people, you need to know about dinosaurs. Why aren't there dinosaurs in there? He goes, man, it's a relationship book. But you see, people come at the Bible wanting things to be in it so that they can, you know, be justified in what they believe or don't believe. We have the Bible. God goes, you know, how you were created is basically irrelevant. Mm. You're created. Mm. Like whether dinosaurs existed, is that going to change your marriage? <laughs> is that like, okay, how, is that, how long is the earth? How did the earth, how, how, how old is the earth? I go, oh, I don't know, man, it wasn't there. <laughs> you you go, no. I said, well, how do we know? Well, the scientists say, so were they there? No. Well, how do they know? <laughs> you ever had that argument with your friend? They go, this happened. They go, were you there? No. Well, how do you know? Well, I heard it from a guy that heard it from a guy that heard it from a guy. And you've got to think about those things. If science was so clear, there would be no Christian scientists. People have lots of opinions on assumptions that they make that they don't know anything about. Mm. Actually, if you look at creation in Genesis, it's pretty amazing. If you were going to write a false book, would you get the order of creation right? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't put the sea animals first and then the animals the land. You'd go, oh, God just either just created animals or that was it. So actually, if you look at what's in there and how you can condense the whole point of creation into three chapters, it's pretty actually amazing. You go to scientists, I want you to condense creation into three chapters. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. That's the mind-blowing thing. You know, if you feel like there's no, and I, I said this guy, I said, I can prove to you that God exists scientifically. You give me an hour. He's like, rrr, rrr, rrr. I said, okay. <laughs> Let me ask you the real question. If I could prove to you that God exists scientifically and he speaks to us through the Bible, would you become a Christian? He said, no. I said, well, end of conversation. <laughs> Because you're not really after the truth, you're just after an argument. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible is written in a way that demands a leap of faith. Yeah. I think about it, even with the religious. They go, well, uh, you know, Mark 16, 16 says, believe and be baptized. Why does it say believe, repent and be baptized? Well, it's written to Jews that already knew what repentance was. Well, this verse says, repent and be baptized. Where's the belief? Well, if you put the two together, it's pretty obvious. All right. But it's written in a way that you actually have to know your Bible. Right. You go, that's like me saying, you know, to make Lennox a cup of tea, I put a kettle on and put a tea bag in. You go, well, why didn't you put and milk, etc.? Because everybody knows you put milk in, etc. <laughs> right. okay. Well, that, that's not technically, that's illogical. And then I go, well, Kira, I just put some water in a cup and I put something else in it. Well, that doesn't make sense. They're contradictory. Do you see, but so the Bible's written that if you, it's, it's actually demanding that you read the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's written in a way that if you just want to take one scripture out of context, you can. But actually, it's written in such a way that goes, you need to get the Bible out and actually read it. Right. And when you read it, it starts to make sense. And sometimes it is a bit like a movie. You ever watch uh, Usual Suspects? Yeah. The movie, it's one of those thrillers that you watch, and then you go, no! No, or what's that magician one? Um, <laughs> now you see me. Then you go, I didn't even watch it again, straight away. <laughs> I, I, I get like, that's how the Bible is. You read something, you go, oh, I think that's what, go, no. 
It's meant to be read every day and digested, yeah. not just flipped open when you want. Come on. You see, the spiritual heart reads the Bible and sees God's heart behind it. Come on. The unspiritual heart doesn't. And then we go on. We talk about, you know, um, basically, uh, Revelation 10, the significance of the sealing is more as a warning. The sound of the seven trumpet suggests the last trumpet at the end of the world. We'll see this in Revelation 11, 15. Before this occurs, however, John must eat this little scroll, and we'll find out why he has to eat the little scroll. The low man, he don't eat this. Okay. <laughs> All right, Revelation 10, 11. Okay. Uh, it's about comforting the disturbed and disturbing the comfortable. It says, Then a voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on that land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I ate it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. So again, we know that the Bible interprets the Bible. So where's this concept of a scroll and anything it come from? It's actually from Ezekiel 2, 9. And it's this concept of a prophet that when you're a prophet, you get the truth from God. And you, you, I'm sure we all felt this. The first time we studied the Bible, you go, this is awesome. I can see where I'm going wrong. I can see how to become a Christian. This is exciting. And then there's that sour bit. That, that means if I'm lost, all these other people are lost. And so there's the sweetness of seeing that you're lost and how you can become a Christian. But then there's this sourness of, that means most of the world is lost. I'm not sure I like that. And so as you digest it, we have this concept of this sweet and the sour. That the gospel is great. I mean, what are the, you think about what is one of the most terrible things that can happen to a human being. He can get to Judgment Day believing he's a Christian and find out at Judgment Day that he's not really a Christian. Yeah. Surely that has to be like the worst thing in the entire world. Yeah. But it's this concept of this sting that we have with the word of God, but then what it actually means for the rest of the world. And if you, if you ever preach the gospel, whether it's studying the Bible with someone or literally doing it on stage, you'll know that, that every single time I preach, there is somebody that goes, thank you so much, I really needed that. And there's another person, whether they're bold enough, will go, I hate you, I hate that message, I don't want to come back to next week. And if those aren't the two reactions, I haven't done my job. I haven't done my job. So when people walk out of the service that I've preached and they're leaving because of the message, that's just part and parcel of it. Because it's sour to them. Now, the contents of this little scroll was evident, uh, evidently the remainder of Revelation. So that scroll there, it's what's going to happen in Revelation. But this does not signal the, uh, signal the complete judgments. So Revelation 10, 11 constitutes a recommissioning of John to continue prophesying God's message is not being fully delivered yet. So what is John think is going, man, I've already taken in so much, I'm overwhelmed with Revelation, but that's more. Do you remember the first time you studied the Bible? And you go, okay, seeking God, I'm not doing that. Okay, I'll seek God, Bible, okay, that's the truth. Okay, evangelism, I've got to do that. Don't know if I want to do that. And then you go, man, that's enough. Thank you very much. Okay, that, that, how many studies do we have? Four? Or like, you know, you go, no, there's five, six, seven. <laughs> then you do like, no, actually, like, forget this. <laughs> I remember studying the Bible. I studied the Bible. I went, okay, this is great. Yeah, I want to seek God. Bible's the word of God. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, discipleship. <laughs> Okay, this evangelism like, okay, I see them doing it, so I'll get my head around them, but I'm not, not that happy. Then that light and darkness, I'm lost. Okay, well, I'm getting drunk and doing drugs, so they've got me there. Uh, but then uh, all these other religious people are lost. I said, that's enough. And I just ran for the hills. I was like, forget this, met my, met, met my mate, mates down the pub, got drunk, tried to sleep with the woman, said, that's enough. John was feeling that sort of emotion of that's enough, not because he wanted to go out and sin, but... The Word of God in its entirety is overwhelming. Yeah. That is why people won't read the Bible. However, what is more overwhelming is seeing your life go down the tube the older you get. Yeah. Now, what kinds of things in God's Word are most pleasant and exciting to you? What things do you find hard to swallow? Now, are there any biblical teachings that you tend to question? Let's, let's hit some nerves here. What about submission and surrender? You know, I don't mind surrendering to God, but I ain't surrendering to that guy over there. <laughs> you know, I would date a man if the word submission wasn't in the Bible. How about this one, brothers? I would date a sister if I didn't have to lead the way and be more humble than her. 
Oh. <laughs> you know, in order to teach submission, you've got to model submission. Okay. Uh, I think about just evangelism. What is it? Is it surrender? Is it self-righteousness? Is it criticalness? Here's another quote. This is a um, uh, uh, Denzel Washington. We like Denzel. Okay. This is a good one. It says, you, you'll never be criticized by someone who is doing more than you. You'll always be criticized by someone doing less. Remember that. Oh. And you think about that. Is, isn't that actually true? Who do we get critical towards? Our leaders. Right? Because they're telling us to do something and they're doing more. It's quite, if you're in leadership, you've got to get used to that. So it's a human emotion that you must recognize in yourself. So, you know, if Solomon's messing up, I go, okay, right, okay, whatever, just hug him. Okay, here we go. But I don't walk around with that Solomon. <laughs> if my leader kick sort of does something and says, I need to do this. <laughs> but you've got to recognize that's your problem. That's your issue. It's not your leadership issue. That's a way that God has created us to show how unspiritual we are and how we need to be spiritual in order to follow. You cannot follow your husband, your your leader, whatever it is, unless you are spiritual, unless you believe God is in control. So the reason the wives submit to the husbands is because they believe if the husband messes up, God will deal with it. The reason we follow leaders in the kingdom is because we know if they mess up, God will deal with them. Right. What we're fearful of is that God is not in control yeah. and God won't meet justice out. Believe me, he can see everything. Yeah. You know, if you do have issues in your heart, are you resolving them? You know, I think about there'll always be sin in the church. You know, like in a marriage, you'll always have fights in a marriage. A good marriage does not not have fights. A bad marriage is a marriage that has fights and doesn't resolve them. Mm. A good marriage is a marriage that has fights and resolves them. You can't avoid fights because you've got two sinners. Mm -hmm. Same with Christians in the church. A false Christian or church is a false Christian or church because it has sin in it and doesn't deal with it. Mm. A true church has sin in it, but the leaders deal with it. It's as simple as that. We don't allow the sin to perpetuate. But every church has sin in it. The difference is whether it's dealt with or whether it's not dealt with. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, I think about, did you turn up to evangelism yesterday? I know some of you are working. We need to talk about it. We don't, you know, put things under the table. We go, we were out. You know, some of us wanted to, some of us didn't want to. But that's what we do as Christians. We will never apologize for evangelizing or calling people to evangelize. And even at moments yesterday, I'm like, I'm not sure if I want to do this. But you come back. And you've met people, you know, and then I heard Kerry was, uh, uh, so we were in town and Kerry, because you did YP, had to uh, go back home and I am saying, can you come down? I said, well, I'll just go on to Sydney Uni on my own. I thought, my heart's man's well, I was going on her own. No, okay, I need to be a good husband. Okay, <laughs> off we go. Okay, right now, okay. Where are you, honey? Where are you, honey? You know, what, you know what it's like when you're evangelizing, you know, it's tough, isn't it? And then that moment came, I was like, husband, okay. So we're walking home, we're evangelizing, and that last person, you know, it's always like the last person, she's at the bus stop. This girl, Caroline, she's like, I said, Kerry, come on. <laughs> and Caroline's like, oh, thank you so much. We just live around the corner. I really want to come. And last night she was texting back and she obviously slept in, as most of us did the first time we were invited to church. Uh, but there was this moment of, we got back and we went on a date with uh, Len and Kerry. It's like, that was a great day. We met someone. It was a high impact. I don't remember whether I wanted to evangelize at exactly 1 p.m. What I remember is the people that you meet. And that's what it's all about. All right, got to move on. Too much fun. Point two, two <laughs> triumphant witnesses. Uh, Revelation 11, 1. Uh, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. There are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, the stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes out of their mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. These men have power to shut up the sky so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesied. And they have the power to turn the water into blood and to strike the earth and every kind of plague as often as they want. Wow. So with the close of Revelation 11 comes the sounding of the seventh trumpet and the end of the first half of the book. Because you'll see that Revelation sort of split into two. But before proceeding with the sounding of the seventh trumpet to end this first half of the prophecy, the temple is measured. 
So this process shows God protection of his people. So the Old Testament temple, you had different sections of the temple. One of those sections was the court of the Gentiles. So it's like, this is where the holy people are, and then there's a place where the Gentiles are. So in the same way, God is saying, look, on the inner side, this is where the Christians will be protected, the holy people. But then those other people outside in the Gentile courts, which wasn't in the original temple, you know, they won't be protected. However, uh, so it seems basically here that it's basically saying there is protection, and we spoke about in Revelation 7 that how it would be a spiritual protection, not a physical protection. Again, let me just uh, talk about the concept of health, wealth, and prosperity, and where false doctrine comes from that point. So in the Old Testament, there was absolutely a doctrine of health, wealth, and prosperity. So God gave them the land of Israel. He said, if you are righteous, your lambs won't have miscarriages, your wives won't have miscarriages, so the world, which is very worldly, will look at you and go, why does your life go so well? We worship the true God and they would come. Okay? But did it work? No. Because man is ungrateful. And we, we have to watch our own hearts and go, you know, God has given us so much, and yet we go, does God really love me? So God actually understands that that doesn't work, that people get ungrateful. Think about divorce. People marry a beautiful wife. She's a great wife, and afterwards I'm bored. I've had this wife for four years. Let me trade her in for a new one. That's exactly how the world is. And that's because man's heart is wicked. Whereas in Christianity, God says, you know what? The only way to keep true spiritual uh, people saved till they die is to give them hardship. So I'm going to send my son down, give them a, a constant testing, so that every day they have to wake up and go, do I want to love God? Wow. Mm. And we need it, or we don't actually stay spiritual. We wonder. That's why we need things like persecution, to really test our hearts. Here it says that um, this persecution will last for 1,260 days. We know as we studied Revelation and then the numerology, any concept of three and a half, three and a half years, um, or a multiple of that, which is 1,260, this is a time of persecution. It's not an exact time, as we go through and let the Bible interpret the Bible. We'll see, it's just a period. It's a time of insecurity. You have these two witnesses who go out evangelizing together, or they go out preaching together. Um, and that's where you see that how Jesus sent out people in twos. That's why we meet up. That's why I went up and met with Kerry. We know what it's like evangelizing on our own. You ever been to a set evangelism time and go, amen? You go, when I walk home, I'm going to evangelize people. And you don't. You ever done that? I've done that. Okay, this week I didn't do that. I was really proud of myself. <laughs> but you know, it's not always the way. But it's this, this idea of strength. They preached a powerful message, like John the Baptist, which was repent. They were clothed in sackcloth. Why? Because there was, there was heart there. Now, when we go out and we evangelize, we can't be judgmental. We can't be self-righteous. You have to understand, everybody that we study the Bible with that is against God or just ignorant, they have been deceived by Satan. They are not the enemy. Even somebody entrenched in deep false doctrine like a Jehovah's Witness, something, they're not the enemy, they've just been listening to the enemy. So we cannot be unkind to people because then we are like Satan or like the false prophets. We need to gently and kindly unwind everything that they know and teach them the truth. Because if people really knew the truth, they'd be queuing at the door. If people knew how great our marriages were, the people that want to get divorced, they'd be queuing in the morning. If they knew about pre-marriage counseling, post-marriage counseling, parenting. We went uh, for a date with Len and Kira, thanks so much, last night. Yeah. This is the difference. So we were evangelizing, I think it was with uh, Alyssa, um, and there was this kid that was kicking off. Can you remember that? This kid, mom's walking down, this kid is like, Rah! in the middle of the street, and you're like, hmm. Went to Lennox and Kira's, you've got uh, Solomon took the boys out with um, Megan. The boys come home at half eight. Len and Kira are like, upstairs, time for bed, off they go. I go, don't you go and brush their teeth with them? I said, no, they know what to do, they know the routine. They go up, it's bedtime, brush their teeth, into bed, boom. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So, that's the difference between biblical parenting and non-biblical parenting. Mm. And let me just tell you, I know which one I want in my life. Okay. Um, but you've got these people that are out there preaching. I love, I, I love seeing pregnant women, like seeing Fung out there evangelizing. Because I know that when women are pregnant they're evangelizing, they look at Samuel and go, you're late? Why? <laughs> you, know, you didn't come? Why? You know what I mean? It's like, 
Okay, Phil, you just, your message, your life is your message. <laughs> I'm like, Aaron, take lots of photos on Facebook, out with the wife and the baby in the, you know what I mean? That, that's what it's meant to be. Come on. Um, I was talking to uh, Kira, we were talking about evangelizing on campus. She said, yeah, I remember taking the kids on campus. It was weird for them and us, but we were out there with the boys, here we go. But that's the difference between true disciples and yeah. non-disciples. Yeah. We don't see those things as an excuse, we see them as an opportunity. Yeah. They're preaching with conviction, you know, Kevin the Legend led a second Bible talk on Friday night. <laughs> and, uh, a few tricky questions came his way, he's like, no, no, no. Yeah, just, you know, there's power. I love seeing power in the young Christians. We played Risk. You know Risk. Oh, so Risk is, uh, it's a game of um, opinions, shall we say. Uh, it's a game where as Christians we can lie and cheat. Well, some of us Christians. I know. Okay. Okay, right. But he's Finn. He's young Christian Finn. And Chris is like, oh, Risk, you can't do this, you can't do this. And this is Finn's answer. I'm all in, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Satan, I'm all in. I'm going to kill you. I'm with Finn, baby. But there's a leader in the, in the future. He's yeah. so got conviction, yeah, testing right. himself on Chris. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. But I think about it. This is preaching with power. Yeah. This is having conviction. This is what the religious world does not have. Come on. You know, you have to, I don't need to evangelize. You have fun, I don't, they see she's preaching, she got involved, somebody in LA phoned her up and said, hey, my relative has cancer, we need somebody to speak with her in Cantonese. She studied the Bible with this uh, mature lady in three days and she was baptized. Oh. Oh. She's pregnant. Come on, it is a gospel of power. Come on. Now, it goes on in Revelation 11 7. Uh, there's a war on the saints, we've got to remember it. Now when they've finished their testimony, the beasts that come up from the abyss will attack them and overpower and kill them. Hold on, I thought they were strong. Yeah, but Satan is also strong. Yeah. It says their bodies will lie in the streets of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, and where also the Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, men from every people, tribe, language, nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them. They will celebrate by sending each other gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and the terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. At that very hour there, there was a severe earthquake, and a tenth of the city collapsed. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe had passed, the third woe is coming. So just a few, little bit of explanation here. It talks about how the Sodom and Egypt and also the place where the Lord was crucified, which starts in Jerusalem. So you're sitting here and you're going, well, where's the post persecution going to come from? You know, if I don't live in Egypt, will I not be persecuted? He's actually using the places where the holy were always persecuted. Okay, so in Sodom, that's where Lot, who was righteous, was persecuted. Egypt, that's where Israel was persecuted. Obviously where uh, Jesus was crucified. So he's going, there's going to be persecution everywhere. When people read, heard this, they would have gone, these are the images of, you remember that time when we were really persecuted? So we might say, you know, it's like being persecuted in India. You go, yeah, that picks up a mind for me of people with clubs and everything. So he's, for dramatic effect, he's actually talking about the times where they've been persecuted in the past. Again, three and a half days. It's not exactly three and a half days. It's this three and a half day. It's a time of persecution. Will these people be persecuted and killed? Yeah. Doesn't it surprise you sometimes as you read the book of Acts that one of the apostles, James, is beheaded? Like, hold, on, hold on, Lord. He's an apostle. You trained him up. Surely he should have lived a long life and gone on to preach everywhere. You see, if your leaders aren't killed, then what, what, who's going to give courage to the ordinary disciples? So as soon as you sign up for leadership, it's like, you're in for trials. People go, I want to be a leader. When the Bible says it is a noble task to be a leader, you've got to understand the concept that was being written in. The leaders were the first to be killed in the first century. So it's not, it's a nice idea to be a leader. Everybody needs to be a leader or the church will not grow. It's this concept of they're the first to be killed. But then it's talking about no matter what happens, the message is going to get out to everybody. So there's this war going on, a spiritual war. In Colossians 1.23, it talks about how it's proclaimed to every creature under heaven. 
It's amazing the power when you start preaching. Um, I know the leaders of the church meeting in Paris will then be there, but we can't because of COVID right now. We're planning out the evangelization of more cities. So I want to remind you of just how the church has grown since 2006, since it started in Los Angeles. We have, from that one place, seen God grow the movement um, to 50 different nations. Wow. So that's in 16 years, from one group of 30 people, God has grown it. Um, you know, uh, I've got a whole load here, uh, but maybe what would be more encouraging is actually to talk to you about some of the ones that are actually going out. Um, so obviously we're in a lot of South America, we're in every continent in the world, but even in this year coming, where Edinburgh is going out in a week or so, uh, Bolivia, Morocco, Casablanca, Doha, Qatar, Uganda, um, Ireland, Germany, uh, Taipei, Taiwan, which uh, uh, Aaron and Fung are leading, um, where I... Mendoza, Argentina, Accra, Ghana, Bangkok, Thailand, uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. I've already put Ke uh, Kevin's name on it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kevin, this is really fun. <laughs> Nairobi, Kenya, Tana, Madagascar, Colombo, Sri Lanka, uh, Bratislava, uh, Slovakia, Guatemala City, Guatemala, uh, Bangui, Central Africa, Lusaka, Zambia, Kontonu, Benin, Bucharest, Romain. Jerusalem in 2025. Um, there's more. Bicol in the Philippines. Combat Chana, Bolivia. Sorry, I've murdered that one. Brisbane and Melbourne as well. That's just the next couple of years. Are we going to do that? No, God's going to do that. Yeah, we are. So I don't have time to go through all the 120 churches that are already planted in 14 years. Mm. So that's over 10 a year, but obviously it gets more and more as it goes on. So COVID isn't slowing us down. COVID is speeding us up because where other people are scared to go, true disciples are not. You know, God can grow. We're going to talk in the leaders meeting this week just about growing your Bible talk. Let me challenge you to go, we, I think it's difficult. We sent four disciples into China two years ago. They have tripled to 12. Come on. They are not allowed to evangelize. It's illegal. So grow your Bible talk without evangelizing. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? That's a real challenge. But that's a small Bible talk. That's all it is. That's what you need to look at your Bible talk. Give me two years, we'll triple this Bible talk. Because we can evangelize. We can actually speak to people. We can start, They just have to walk around the streets praying, and people come up to them and go, what are you doing? I'm praying. Oh, can I study the Bible with you? That's literally how it happens. So if you can triple your Bible talk without evangelizing, imagine what you can do when you do actually evangelize. Mm -hmm. Send the trumpet. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, very quickly, uh, Revelation 11, 15, 7, 19, the seventh seal sounded his trumpet, there were loud cries in heaven, which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of this Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces, worshipped God, said, we give thanks to you, Lord Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. For the time has come for judging the dead and the rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your saints and those who revere your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a great hailstorm. So this passage definitely seems to indicate the last judgment which we'll get into in Revelation 21 and 22. But what we've got to see here is there is a time where it's just talking about one section of Revelation. You've got these sections of warnings from the forms of the trumpet. Um, he'll pour out the bowls of wrath and finish the job as we get on. We're seeing a lot of um, stuff in the first part of Revelation, which is this is what's going to happen. What we're actually going to move in now is this concept of going behind the scenes. So from next week, we're getting into Revelation that goes, well, actually, here's what's happening behind the scenes. There's Satan, there's the war in heaven and everything like that, which is what most people like to get into. But what we must understand here is, is that we will be rewarded. I think one of the most misconceived ideas is actually that what you do on earth will reflect what you get in heaven. Because false doctrine goes, well, grace covers everything, there is no concept of actually being rewarded for what you do. 
So if I was trying to go, well, you're just getting to heaven. I deserve to get in heaven. I'm a good guy. Absolutely not. I was talking to people and said, well, this guy we were evangelized, he said, well, I just can't believe in a God that will punish me for sinning. Well, does that mean I don't believe in the police force? I mean, that's just ridiculous. On the other hand, there will be a great reward. And I think what some people don't realize is, is the more you give to God on earth, the greater your reward in heaven. So when people go, I don't want to be a leader, I don't want to be a missionary, remember this, you actually don't understand what you're saying. In eternity, you will be rewarded for what you have done on earth, for eternity. All right? So imagine, obviously, as we get into the descriptions of heaven, it's not physical. But imagine it was. You go, okay, well, I've got a house, I'm in heaven, but there's no toilet. <laughs> but he got one. Why do you get one? Well, he was always out evangelizing. <laughs> so I've got a house without a toilet, you should have done more on earth. <laughs> now you're laughing, and obviously heaven's not physical, but at least it gives you the impression of this concept that if you're going to go to heaven, you want the best that's going to be in heaven. So yes, if you live a devoted life, which very few do, and you really give your heart to God, you will receive all the rewards in heaven rather than just some of the rewards. Maybe a better analogy is Christmas. So at Christmas you get presents. You know how many presents you get? Depends how many people you've loved during the year. <laughs> right? It's very, very simple. If you've given to lots of people through the year, you'll get lots of presents. And it's a real deal, I've got no cards. Well, better have a different year this year. <laughs> it's as simple as that, isn't it? It's in the same. We understand these things from a worldly point of view. Why do we reject them from a spiritual point of view? The reason is because we listen to false doctrine. Jesus sat next to God because he sacrificed the most. The apostles all had thrones because they sacrificed the most. The next underneath will be those that give their hearts to God completely. That's what motivates me, is that I want to be as close to God as possible. I don't want to be at the back of the line. You ever been to a concert, and there's like 50,000, you get the seat right at the back, and go, what's he saying? What's he saying? <laughs> or, you have, or you have that, um, you know, the, the bit right in the middle, which is all the technical bit where they go, what? And you get the seat right behind that? Oh, you're like, oh. well, I'm halfway, but I can't see anything. That's not what I want in heaven. I want a front row seat. So I'm going to burn out rather than fade away. <laughs> Okay, an end, but not an end. So this is one section of Revelation. We're then get into all the juicy stuff next. Mm. But it's sweet and sour. As we go out to evangelize, there'll be persecution. There's a little persecution article there. You know, I got my first shot, go away. <laughs> uh, I was with Chris, I, think, I, was, I can't remember what I went, okay, we're back. Okay, you know what I mean? We're back, okay. Um, two triumphant witnesses. If you're struggling with evangelism, do what I did. I called up Chris. Buddy, you're the boldest guy I know. Let's go. We had a great time, which was awesome. And the seventh trumpet. Okay, this is the end. But it's not the end, and to God be the glory.